Well, good evening. I'm Pastor Jack Hollis. You're at Germantown Christian Center, and we are delighted to welcome you that are joining us here online, virtually. Uh, we're going to be sharing the Word and having a great devotional tonight, so if you get, uh, get your Bible out or your iPad or iPhone or what have you, we're going to just share some things about the very promise of God, His mercy, His love, and His power that's towards you and me. And you know what? There's days and times when you get up in the morning, and it is one thing that you need to remind yourself that God has a merciful plan for your life. That God is merciful. That he is a loving Heavenly Father. And, you know, it's good to remind yourself of some truths because if you haven't guessed it or not, the world is a frightful place at times to be living in. And um, not everybody around you is probably pumping you up, encouraging you, blessing you, and, and just letting you know how God cares about you and the plan that God has for you is going to come to pass in Jesus' name. Not all of us have those people speaking to us. A lot of times you're going to have to do some things and you're dealing with... Uh, well, folks, that aren't necessarily listening to the voice of the Father. But you know what? You and I are as believers. And I firmly believe that as we walk in step with the plan of God, listen to his loving voice, he's going to chart our path to, to victory. And we're going to find ourselves right in the smack dab middle of his will. And that's where I want to be, and I know you do as well. And so if you'd like to turn over to Psalm 103, I'd like to share some scriptures with you that encourages us uh, about what you and I can do to basically... Embrace the word in our lives, walk in his mercy, and find his help. As Psalm 103, beginning here, it says at the, at the 10th verse, it says, He does not treat us as our sins deserve. Aren't you glad God doesn't treat you as your sins would otherwise deserve you to be treated? Amen. That's mercy. How do you like mercy? Yes. You don't get what you deserve. I mean, thank God. You don't have to be a wretched, terrible person and do terrible things to be thankful for mercy. I mean, you know, you know God isn't great on the curve. It's not like you got to be really, really bad so you can really appreciate grace. I had somebody tell me many, many years ago that, that knew my testimony. I was brought up in a Christian home, and I just didn't do, I just didn't get out in the world. I just, you know, was just didn't want to. And someone told me, well, see, you don't fully appreciate the love and the grace of God because you didn't, you didn't find yourself in all the depths of sin and all this stuff. And I thought, you are absolutely losing it. How in the world would you say that someone has to experience the depth of sin and the devil beating you up, blackening your eyes, so to say, for you to appreciate the fact that God is a loving God and cares about you and has a merciful plan for you. And someone said, well, you just, I said, no, no, listen, I don't have to smell a skunk to know that I don't need to get tainted by its, 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 its hindsight. Amen? You know, so many times that you have to say, well, you've got to experience, no, I don't. I don't have to experience sin to appreciate walking in the grace and the bounty and the provisioning of God. And so we don't need to, 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 to degrade ourselves in those days. We ought to be able to say, Father, I want the testimony of Jesus. I mean, Jesus, he was tempted in all points like, he, like we are, but he without sin. I don't, we don't have to get down in the muck and mire of carnality in order to be thankful for the grace of God and his mercy. And so the Bible says that, that, that God does not treat us as our sins would deserve or repay us according to our own iniquities. Why? Because you're forgiven in the name of Jesus. And it doesn't matter if you were forgiven of a little or a lot. Fact is, God isn't great on the curve. And so he doesn't sit there and say, you know, that, well, well you know, I, oh, man, I, I forgave you of a lot today. You better not be out of line too much tomorrow because I only got so much to spread around in your life. My word, the mercies of God are new every morning. So guess what? Every time you wake up, God is up there ready to forgive you and help you and, and, and encourage you throughout, the, throughout our, you know, our, our everyday activities. Then verse 11 says, For as, I, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear and reverence him. Remind yourself of how much higher God is. In other words, try not to bring God down to your level. Try to bring yourself up to his level. We, we have too many people, I hate to say preachers, who are trying to bring you know, God down to our level. Uh, God already did that through Jesus. And the point is, he, he allowed Jesus to be accessible to us, to elevate us to his level. We're king's kids. Let me think about this moment. You're a child of the most high God. That's an elevation to wherever, whatever ancestry you all have. I know it's really popular. I've got, I've got acquaintances and friends who have done this. But, you know, they, they take these DNA saliva tests. They want to know where they came from. And I had someone not long ago, he's, he's a gentleman I know up in New Jersey, and uh, his first name's Rob, and uh, just a funny guy. He, he's just, he's a trip. And uh, he just said, well, I went ahead and, 
and uh, took one of these saliva tests. He said he got the results back a few days ago, and he said he knew kind of what he was, but one of the things he got back was he was like, I don't know, one-fifth or something Irish. So now he wants to change his name to Mick whatever, you know, for his last name. Just, he just wants to play. Because he's like, well, I didn't know I was you know, a little bit Irish. I want to act like, you know. It, it's funny. We, we, we want to act differently, and he's just he's, he's, a, he's a comedian. But the fact is sometimes we find out what we are, and then we say, oh, I like that. I want to adopt a little bit of that because, oh, I like that. You know, you're from an English ancestry. Well, great, so you play that up a little bit. And yeah, I, let me just tell you right now, we are spending so much time, too much time of where we came from and not really enough time to what, you know, where we're going and what God did in us. Your ancestry was changed the moment you accepted Christ. You became a new creature, a new species never having existed before. The problem is we had too many Christians caring about where they came from and their ancestry naturally and not caring so much about their Holy Ghost ancestry. And, and see, in Christ, you're a new creature. You're forgiven. You've got the help of God, the mercy of God, the Holy Spirit right there waiting and, and available to us. And so the Bible says, as far as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who reverence or fear him. Understand, you know, just know, know who loves you. Know what he did in you. If you want to identify and cling on to something, again, I have no, there's no problem with finding out all the, I'm not, I'm not speaking against ancestry stuff. That's fine. But make sure you are identifying not so much to where you came from, but identify in the God that has saved you, redeemed you, and set you on high. And, and, and every day tells you how much he loves you and cares about you. Make sure that's important. Yeah, and I know we do that, but if you're not careful, you can kind of forget about it. And then go back into the old person. Because you're not the way you were. Aren't you glad you're not acting like you used to? I mean, and, and here's the deal. You don't have to be a terrible person to say, thank God I'm getting better. I mean, you know, it's almost like, you, you know, some people get like, oh, I don't want to. I'm not, it's not, I'm, not, I'm not saying anything bad about you. Saying that you're getting better or that you're not as bad as you were. Hey, I'm not as bad as I was. I mean, you know what I'm saying too? It's, it's just like, thank God we're going from glory to glory day by day. I mean, that's a good thing. So don't ever get down on yourself like, you know, you ought to be getting better. And if you do make a mistake, sin. If you do blow it, sin. All you do is ask God to forgive you, and he does, and he just forgets it, forgives you and all that good stuff, and then you position to do better. I had somebody once tell me, well, I just don't understand. You know, I, I just don't think God wants me to, 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 to keep being able to get forgiveness. I said, well, okay, what makes you think that? Well, I, I just know I wouldn't do it. I said, well, aren't you glad you're not God? I mean, the, the fact is, God is better than you. We need to adopt his ways and his thoughts, not asking God to adopt ours. And that's what I'm talking about, bringing ourselves up to his level. And then he goes on to remind us here in verse 12, great verse of scripture, Psalm 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west. Now, just imagine, if you will, you've seen a map, right? And you know there's the east coast and the west coast. Well, this scripture is kind of pointing as, it's saying, as far as the furthest most point east is from the furthest most point west. So imagine you draw a line in space, okay, that goes on and, and goes on forever. Find its end point and the end point over here. And that's, that's what God's saying as far as the east is from the west. The idea is these are two points that are on the extreme end that you, you, you can't even locate them. He says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. That ought to get you somewhat thankful. Then verse 13 says, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear and reverence him. What God is saying is, you know, and, and I know it says father, but it's equal to what a heavenly dad or heavenly father. But it's the same thing for moms. I mean, come on now. I mean, moms have compassion on their kids, don't they? How many moms have ever said something like this? I brought you into this world, and I surely can take you out of it. 
<laughs> I, you ever heard that expression before? <laughs> and, and it was just compassion. You didn't do it. <laughs> you know? and, and so, you know, I mean, we've all seen it. You know, you, have you ever gotten so upset at your kids because of something they did? How many of you have ever, you ever gone ahead and had walls that were freshly painted and then all of a sudden you, after about within a week you found your kid found a Sharpie, one of the big thick ones that you were going to make signs with, you know, poster boards to help them on an assignment, and they were just marking it on the freshly painted walls. Let me clue you in. Sharpies are permanent. They bleed right through whatever you just painted. You know, and now, how, you know, you, you get disgusted with them and all that, but you still love them. You may not be very thrilled with what they did, but you still love them, don't you? Sure you do. I mean, God maybe is not thrilled with everything you're doing. That's why he gives you a way to get forgiveness. But make no doubt about it, he still loves you. Still cares about you. Aren't you glad? Yeah, he's not fickle. Thank God he's not. He says, so as, as, a, as a mother or a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on us. Aren't you glad? And then he reminds us here in verse 14, for he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. What he's saying is he knows how you're formed. You know how he knows that? Because he had a big heart, a big part in playing, getting you formed. Think about that for a moment. You know, God made you in some, you know, in so many ways. He put things in you that he needed and, and was going to help bring out in your life on this earth. God formed you. Now, the problem is some of us have had some renovations that are not orchestrated by God. We've had some architectural design changes, okay? If you ever built a house before, ever seen, you know, you might have architectural drawings and plans. And what will happen is sometimes, and it's not a great thing, but let's just say that, you know, you've got the plans that have been approved and all that. But then the homeowner comes up and says, you know, I really like to have, uh, you know, th this room made a little bit more this way. And so, man, well, we can do that. Well, the problem is you might do that, but you don't realize there may be a consequence on the other end. You know, you can make that bathroom bigger, but maybe that bathroom was then now going to cut into maybe the kitchen. So now you're going to have a smaller kitchen, but a bigger bathroom. Well, you may not have thought about it, but you know, oh, I want a huge bathroom. Well, who doesn't want a big bathroom? I mean, I love to have a big bathroom. You don't like to have a big honking bathroom with whatever you want. Know, but, but if you only got a finite amount of space to work with, where are you going to take it from? Sometimes what we do is we bring, allow others to bring renovation into our lives and we don't realize that maybe we're having to sacrifice something that later we wish we hadn't of. Now you have a kitchen that instead of being enough to accommodate a refrigerator and sink and oven and stove and all that, now it went from, uh, you know, maybe 800 square feet, now it's down to 50. You can't move around, you don't have any room but for a microwave. Well, but you enjoy that bathroom of yours. You know, sometimes in life what happens is we make concessions that later we regret. Don't let the devil con you into making concessions that later you regret. And so God knows your life. He formed you. Make sure that you're constantly asking him, the architect, what his design for your life is that day. Father, what do you want for me today? What is it that you want me to become today? What are you trying to form in me today, looking, at, as a, looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith? We all know these things. Then he says, and remember that we are dust. He knows how fragile we are. We really are fragile, aren't we? Yeah. I know. You say, well, I am not. I am strong. And hey, I get this. You know, hey, yeah. In the natural, you're pretty fragile. Yeah. You're not, you're not, you know I mean? You're not bulletproof. Isn't that right? You're fragile. You need to be in the will of God. You need to have his protection, his guidance, his leadership, his health, his healing. I mean, we need whatever God, you know, and all of his abilities working in us. Because without it, we're fragile. And he says, you know, you're, you're like dust. Yeah, he, so that's why we ought to understand. We're, 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 we're fragile. So, Father, I need you in the magnificent, you know, care and power that you have to watch, it, watch after me, which you form me, so you know where I'm more weak in areas. You know where I'm stronger in other areas. So you can, you can use that information to preserve my life and establish it and grow me up in you. Just give him credit for the ability that he has. Again, his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. 
Just acknowledge that and give him credit. Say, Father, I need you to help me. It is utterly amazing to me the number of times I've seen people live their lives and, and asking God, I mean, expecting God to bless them, but they're living their life without asking God for help. Constantly being in being an attitude of, Father, I can't do this by myself. I'm not going to. I need you to help me here. I need some strength. I need it from you. I need your wisdom. I need your, I, I just, I need you to be a part of what I'm doing and who I am. Those are important things to do. Proverbs chapter 8 has some things around this line too. It kind of speaks about that, that, that we all need to embrace. Proverbs chapter 8, beginning verse 11 says this, for wisdom is better than rubies. Now, you know, I don't know what, I, I guess I, I never memorized the uh, birthstones, so I don't know what ruby, what month rubies are. But um, I think everybody can say rubies would be nice. I mean, they, they're sparkly and shiny and red, I guess. I mean, remember old, remember uh, uh, Dorothy's ruby slippers? I mean, my word, click them three times. There's no place like home. And look where it got her, Kansas. And, but it says wisdom is better than rubies. And all the things that may be desired are not to be compared with it. What he's saying is wisdom is better than anything that you could get naturally. And now we're not talking about wisdom. What kind of wisdom? God's wisdom. Wisdom that comes from the Heavenly Father. Then he goes on to say in verse 12, it says, I wisdom dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. You know, God knows stuff. I mean, God knows stuff. Well, would you mind sharing some stuff you know, God? I sure could sure use some wisdom from you. Let him know that. You know, James chapter 1 says, if anybody lacks wisdom, what are we supposed to do? Ask him for it. Again, it's, I'm just surprised at the number of people who, um, I mean, they'll ask, but usually it's after they've already tried everything else. That's no way to live, folks. Well, I guess I'll, I've tried everything else. I might as well start praying. <laughs> well, maybe we should back up a little bit here and start praying a little earlier in that scenario. Yeah, we, we've all been there, though, haven't we? I mean, we've done silly things like that. And then he goes on to say in, in, um, in uh, well, verse 13, it says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy, and the evil way, and the forward mouth do I hate. What he's basically saying is just don't be like everybody else that's not living for God. You ought to have some things that you just don't like and won't put up with. And the thing about it is you've got to have a standard somewhere. Now, y'all know a little leaven leaven at the whole lump, right? You've heard that expression. The Bible reminds us that basically said a little bit of sin kind of corrupts the rest of it. So if you put up a little bit, you ever know it's like an occupying force that kind of begins to take over. Um, how many know that a, that a few dishes in the sink doesn't seem like a big deal, but generally speaking, a few dishes in the sink kind of grows? How about laundry? You ever one time turn around and you got a few things, you got all caught up with laundry? And the next thing you know, you know, you know, you look over there and you got a whole nother, it's like laundry just grew. You're like, what in the world? I just got laundry done. I, I, my wife says that quite often, especially when my son comes home from college. She'll, she'll say, she'll, she'll, I say, honey, what are you doing? She said, I got to get caught up with this laundry because I know the moment Jack comes home, he's going to dump all that laundry on me and wants it done, you know, and basically right now. And uh, you just know there's just always something to do. We know that. But if we can stay on top of stuff, it's amazing how our attitude is better, isn't it? Because after a while, if you get a problem that starts grows and festering, and for you like the, like the laundry, you let laundry go for four, five, six, seven days. You start looking at that, and you're like, "Well, I mean, after a while, you run out of clean clothes. There's so much you can recycle, right? So you better stay on top of it. But sometimes we get to the place where we just get overwhelmed." And you just get, you can get depressed and discouraged. And those are not great attitudes to have. Don't allow the, 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 the little bit of sin or a little bit of, you know, whatever it might be to stay around. Get dispatch it. Don't allow some things in your life just to stay there when you can deal with it right now. You know, uh, something you got to do, don't procrastinate. Don't put it off. Just get it done. Get it off your plate. Now you got a clean plate. And you know what? We all love clean plates don't we you know i mean okay 
<clears throat> put it this way. How many of you love clean sheets? Yes. Don't you? Definitely. You know, I mean, you know, I, I remember, you know, uh, many years ago, it's probably been close to 20 years ago, we actually had a vacation and we got to go on a cruise. And um, the cruise was great. It was, it was a great time. But you know, one of the greatest things I loved about it was every day they would change the sheets. You know what else was even good? Some, there was a, one time we actually came in and just, you know, laid on top of the bed and took a nap. Just laid on top of the bed. You got a quick little nap. Got up. Guess what they did? Change the sheets. Now, you know that because they were crisp, iron, tucked in. It was just, I, I sat there. I said, honey, I love this. And she looked at me and she says, well, hey, you know how the washing machine works. And you know, where, I mean, you know how to do it. She was letting me know if you want sheets cleaned every day, <laughs> have at it. <laughs> she wouldn't put up any, any obstacles to it. But, but what someone else is doing, it's great. You said, you're just like, ooh, clean sheets, iron pillowcases. Just the folks, there's some things in our life that we could be that way too. You just get yourself squared away right. Your mouth was squared away. You didn't hurt anybody with your words. That's like clean sheets. You know, your attitude was good, like clean sheets. We should endeavor to bless others, be a blessing to others, as well as to ourselves. We could be an instigator of clean sheets for the people around us, if you know what I'm saying. God wants us to go ahead and eschew after the evil, meaning just don't allow it in us, so that we can be a blessing and not a corrupter of others as well as our own lives. He says in verse 14 of that Proverbs 8, Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding, I have strength. Well, he sure does, doesn't he? He said, by me kings reign and princes decree justice. You know the strength of God? God is an absolute amazing, amazing God. You know, he puts people in positions of authority and power. Some people, we get all upset like, well, you just don't know the where I work and the people that are evil. You know what? God brings people up and God allows them to be taken out. Now, when I say take, folks, you reap what you sow. Now, as a Christian, we're excited about that. But sadly, those that are not reaping, not sowing good things aren't going to reap good things. And so what happens, we kind of forget the fact that God can sustain you in the midst of any kind of circumstance. He can put you in a place that you couldn't have gotten to by yourself and can keep you there to the glory and the purposes of God. And so, you know, he says, by, by, you know, by me, he says, princes rule. He says in verse 17, I love them that love me. Well, do you have any of you love Jesus? Yeah. yeah. I love them that love me, and those that seek me early are going to find me. So we just need to continually seek after God, don't we? Now, verse 18, the verse that a lot of us, you know, we, we love. Riches and honor are with me. This is what God says. Riches and honor are with me. Yeah. Durable riches and righteousness, stuff that remains, stuff that actually is substantive, that, that, that's, that's durable, that worth, that's worth something. God's saying riches and honor are with him. Well, folks, I, I'd like to just walk in that. How about you? He said, what are riches and honor? It's amazing. He's not just telling you that you're going to have a handful of rubies or a bunch of gold. Riches and honor. You know, a lot of things are riches. A blessed family. You know, family that's going to heaven, kids that know Jesus and love them, um, a great attitude. You're not depressed, discouraged, but in encouraged. You're a light to the people around you. I mean, there's a lot of things you could say were are riches that, that you can't add up in your bank account. Now, God will bless you too, don't get me wrong, but we need to not limit God to just you know, monetary stuff. You know, after all, the Bible said that the Lord makes you rich and he adds no sorrow to it. What good is a whole bunch of money if you can't enjoy it? I mean, what good is having stuff if the stuff has, has you and you're miserable? I've known some folks in my life over the years that were very blessed, had a lot of stuff, and I've seen the torment that they also had. And um, it was very disturbing. 
because you saw such a toehold that something had on them that prevented them from having the joy that they otherwise should have had. The problem is they were always too concerned about what others wanted to take from them. Questioning the motives of people in their life thinking they're only here for what I have. The devil wants to rob you, make you insecure, make you miserable. So that you can't even enjoy the things that you do have, things that you've worked hard for. See, God wants you to enjoy it. Like he says in 3 John 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. He cares about all of you. And see, that's the reason why that if we will just simply make the decision and the choice to pursue after God, if we'll make the decision to keep some things out of our lives the way that God wants us to, not let things come into us, if we'll regard our life not so much of who we were and what we've done, but in the light of who God is and what he has done, we'll really live a life that's transformed and transformative toward others. I read these verses in Psalm 103, and I just can't help but get encouraged. We do bless the Lord all our soul, don't we? We bless his holy name, don't we? And the Bible reminds us that he has removed our transgressions from us. He has forgiven us then let's act like it, let's live like it, let's talk like it, and let's rejoice like it. Because the Father has compassion on us. Because he is a wonderfully heavenly dad. Amen? God is good, isn't he? Always remind yourself to love one another. Always remind yourself to love one another. Walk in the love of God. Every time you choose to walk in love is an opportunity for you to get closer to God and act more like Jesus. After all, you, you know this is true, but the Bible teaches us God is love. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that if you can walk in love, then you're allowing God to dominate you. You're acting like him. You could be a chip off the old block. You could do a lot worse, amen, than to be just like God. Be Just act like Jesus. I once years ago had somebody say, are you telling me that we can be like Jesus? I said, well, uh, yeah, but God said it first. Some people find it so bizarre that we can actually be like Jesus. That's why he came. He came to be an example to us of what our lives should, be, should look like. Don't sell yourself short and don't sell God short. He's the architect. He planned. He designed. He formed. He's got the plans in front of him. When, when he thinks of you and looks at you, he can just look over here and sees the plans that he has for you. Let him know you want, you want that come to pass you want that to be developed in you you know a lot of times we make the mistake of of God not saying anything as God is asking for advice he's not looking for your your help in, as advice he's wanting you to adopt his help and advice and make it your own we live we move we have a being in this world that's instrumentally important vital in fact to the plans that God has for others but make no mistake about it to be truly successful in life is to do it God's way Amen. I was brought up and uh, with the definition of success I've seen a lot of folks defined as success by material goods and things they've been you know they accumulated and gotten but I was brought up and, and something my mother said to me ingrained it in me. She said, success, Jack, is not like everyone else to define it. She just impressed me. She said, success is the progressive attainment of God-given goals. And see, it's progressive because it, it's, it's every day. There isn't just one place. Success isn't just one choice or one decision or a destination, as it were. It's a progressive attainment Every time, it's like you're, you're constantly attaining something. Moment by moment, you know, day by day, week by week, there are things that you're accomplishing. It's a progressive attainment of God-given goals. It's not, Lord, here's my goal. Bless it. It's God, what is your goal? Let's bring it to pass together. Again, he's the architect. He's the designer. He's got the plans. We want to adopt his plans so this house looks like it's supposed to until the time we see him face to face. And he wants to do it. Let him know you do too. 
Ask him for help. Ask him for wisdom. Ask him for the, the, the advice that he wants to give you. He will. Because the Bible said if you ask, well, you'll receive. Knock and get it open to you. Seek and you're going to find. Praise God, he's still doing it. All you need to do is ask him. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, I hope you got something out of this this evening. I know it's just a short little devotional, but it's okay. I think there's enough in there to help you and bless you and encourage you and, well, allow God to be what he wants to in your life. Well, I just want to say to you, thanks again for listening. Uh, we're going to be back here Sunday morning. We'll be here at 930 and 1030 Central Time, and we'd love to see you. We'll be online at about 1040 or so Central and I uh, would love to see you, as I said, online. would love to see you in person, though. We're meeting in person here at Germantown Christian Center here in Germantown, Tennessee. There's information on the screen about where our church is and when our services are held. But we would love to see you. If uh, we can be of service to you and help, please ask. That contact information, as I mentioned, is on the screen. And at the same time, I want to say thank you again for your faithful support financially of this church and ministry. We, we couldn't do it without you, and thank God we're not going to have to. Thank you for the love and support that you bring uh, and allow, well, this church to continue and these, these, this, this, this medium that we use here to be continuing to, to reach people. Uh, well, I know you're having a great evening. Make it a great week, too. We do love you. Never forget it. Jesus is Lord, and he does care about you. Have a wonderfully blessed evening, and we'll see you real soon in Jesus' name. Bye-bye now.